name is Martin Bachmeier. I work for the Fraunhofer Institute. Um, the title sounds big, Global Business Development Lead. What it actually means is um, that I'm in charge of making kind of a portfolio management across the front of institutes. I'll explain in a minute what it is and look for right technologies and find ways how to monetize those technologies. Um, um, by the way, a couple of days before when I started this presentation, I found that we again, um, like in the last years, won the Thomson Reuters Top 100 Global Innovators Award, which I think is pretty cool. So there's not a lot of companies who in serial roles over the years uh, make that work. And um, the criteria for winning such awards are pretty high and the standards are high. Um, so I think that's a, a good, good sign on, on the innovation process that Fraunhofer can deliver as such. So uh, who of you have heard of Fraunhofer before at all? Yeah, you have, okay, obviously. And we work together, but that, that's the standard answer, um, especially uh, if across the borders from Germany to Austria, Switzerland, people have heard of Fraunhofer because it's German-speaking territory, or kind of German. Um, and if you go north, south, east, west, it gets thinner in Europe. And if I get, go across the Atlantic Ocean to the US, nobody knows what it is. Um, this is why I put some facts and figures up to just impress you, right? Um, how big we are and how cool the things um, are that we're doing. Um, so it's actually founded in 1949 in Munich. Um, the reason for the foundation of the Fraunhofer Institute was actually a sad one because after World War II, the whole um, climate in Germany obviously was down and um, the government tried to find ways how to bring up um, the economies and uh, get German uh, research and, and uh, knowledge back to where it was before the World War. Um, that's the true background of this whole thing. So they started a really, really big kind of the biggest incubation process for a while that at, attached to all of the universities in Germany, a Fraunhofer Institute was funded with some special um, technologies or whatever focal themes um, they wanted to work on with those specific universities. And they made kind of an incubation process that after university education for two or three years, these young students worked with Fraunhofer and then were sent to the industry to have better developed, better and educated um, engineers and scientists across Germany. This is the other reason why it's very well known in Germany, but not outside of Germany, because the heritage as such was a pure German focus in the beginning um, to strengthen the power of the German economy. Now it's not that important any longer. Germany is back on track with some backlashes the last couple of weeks, but I still think they're doing well. And um, now we're trying to develop more of an international uh, roadmap for Fraunhofer because we think there is a scope of um, this scientific work that can be used um, across the borders of Germany, even in the US or in other countries within Europe. That's one part of my role, um, and I will talk about that in a minute. So it's uh, founded um, a while ago. It's very decentralized structured, which is um, one reason for the complexity how to get in touch with Fraunhofer. If you just go to a Fraunhofer website, you will fail because every one of those 65 institutes has a different website um, with different technologies over there, which is just a matter of the history of it all. We try to change that, but it's very complex. Um, so you have 23,000 employees working in all of those German cities. That's the landscape of Germany. And by the way, the focus is down here in Bavaria, so that's the reason why I'm allowed to stand here at an Invest in Bavaria conference. The headquarters in Bavaria and the institute that I represent, which is the biggest one within Fraunhofer, um, is in Bavaria as well. So there's different things that Fraunhofer can do to the industry. One is what we call a contract research for clients. Um, that's something that's not well known because nobody must talk about that. Um, so there are companies that I can name now because that's official, like Siemens, like BMW, like Audi, um, go to Fraunhofer and say, please help us with this specific technology, with that need, um, find us a solution for this and that. And then they pay for the research work and then the IPs go to this company, they use it. And then somewhere in the BMW, in the engine, I'm making this up, um, there is some Fraunhofer technology inside. So that's one big element of what Fraunhofer is doing, contractual research um, with the industry. Another part is um, collaborative research with other partners. We talked about the Max Planck Institute today, universities, um, the MIT in Boston, etc. Um, so Fraunhofer works together with other partners um, with real forefront and applied research, especially for the big things like renewable energies or rare earth or things that are really hard um, to tackle on your own, where you just need a common effort to make stuff happen. 
um, that's the second big element that Fraunhofer is working on. The third one that's a smaller portion but still interesting for Fraunhofer is consulting services um, based on the research capabilities to have in certain institutes that just like a body shop rent their people, their intelligent engineers to other companies to advise them and consult them on what to do which could be interesting for American companies as well. Just say, I don't want you to invent stuff, but have a look at this and give me your opinion on that. Um, kind of consulting of smart technologists. And the third one, that's my uh, part where um, I'm mostly in. I'm in section one and section four, so to say. So I go to the industry and um, ask them, what do you want? And then try to create new work for Fraunhofer. And on the other side, those Fraunhofer technologists in their spare time, let's say, um, work on creative stuff to make this world a better place and come up with interesting patterns, ideas, prototypes, etc. that I have a look at together with a team and say, um, okay, this technology that's not really good enough for that industry, but if we start an iterative process with the industry, we get it from a prototype to a first pilot series, uh, we try first deployment, we try to get a first installation, um, and we check out where is the market. Then I write a business plan, I look for investors, and we try to get a new venture created um, together with an investor um, to, in order to be able to, to sell technologies. One of the reasons why I'm saying this is, um, I will talk about that in a second, um, Fraunhofer is a partly governmental organization from Germany, so they have certain restrictions on what they're allowed to do and what not. So they must not sell something to consumers themselves, as an example. Um, they must not sell at a price that is too competitive, a technology to the market that is sold by another German company, because as there's governmental money involved, that's an anti-compete thing um, that's not possible, so there's certain restrictions. So the usual process, if an interesting IP is created by Fraunhofer, is um, that a new venture is founded, a new co, in the classical way. Um, all of the IPs go into this new corporation. Um, some of the engineers usually go in this new co, and some new business people are hired um, to try to figure out the management of this new company. And then we look for an investor. Fraunhofer can hold a certain share, up to 25%. Um, it can be more than that, but then it gets difficult in terms of politics. Up to 25% is a standard process. And um, then this new co goes to market and Fraunhofer earns licenses um, from every unit sold or service installed, etc., etc. So Fraunhofer is not selling to the industry. Fraunhofer can only license to the industry or be part of a new corporation and get licenses from this new corporation. That's the, the usual way how Fraunhofer worked, which is important to understand um, some details I'll explain later. So these are the big, big, big Fraunhofer lead projects, as they're called. These are the big themes um, all of the 65 institutes work on right now, which is a good set of um, what's on everybody's mind. So there's nothing missing here. And uh, actually successful in all of those parts. So they have stuff in renewable energy, which is amazing. They were part of the next generation of GPS satellites called Galileo in Europe that are now in the air and producing new interesting technologies. Um, they're doing autonomous driving together with Mercedes-Benz and other stuff. The front of us involved in anything where cool stuff is happening right now in terms of technology. And the good thing for you as an investor, Fraunhofer is a non-profit organization. They don't expect to get, become rich with what they're doing. They just want to have a good living. That's no, serious. Um, so it's, it's easy to get a reasonable deal. I don't say you can rip us off, but it's, it's possible to get a fair deal um, because the major purpose is not to get money. The major purpose is to get enough money to keep up the work they're doing and to see their technology in real life. That's the real thing they're doing. And they have some elements in what they're doing that create a lot of money. Um, we'll see that in a minute. Um, so they're in a pretty luxury position right now, but we hope that this doesn't change. So the institute that I work for is the so-called Fraunhofer IIS, which is the German abbreviation for Institute for Integrated Circuits, in German Institut für Integrierte Schaltungen, that's why it's IIS. Um, the major headquarters here is in Erlangen. About a thousand people in total, including the students, are working there and they have certain um, important technologies that they work on. So this is a subset of Fraunhofer, that's the Fraunhofer IIS, and the technologies I'm going to talk to today are all created by this Fraunhofer Institute. 
but if you have any appetite to talk about other technologies here and see if there's something on the list that could be interesting or you want to have more information in the front of overall, please get in touch with me. I have access to the right people. I'm not the right man for everything, that's a lot, um, but I can bring you in contact with the right people. So here it gets more precise on, on some things that we are doing there. Um, audio multimedia uh, is one of the most famous inventions that Fraunhofer did was MP3 20 years ago, um, which brought in a lot of cash, which was positive and made them um, pretty famous in, in certain industries. They do a lot about IC design, obviously from the integrated circuits, there should be IC involved, um, but a lot of clever algorithms, sensor systems, communication. So everything you can do with a chip somewhere in electronics, this Fraunhofer IS um, has some people working on stuff. Um, we have an interesting test and application center that can be used with, um, um, for different areas. And so that's a pretty big like a uh, warehouse hall, um, which is used for sports location systems, for logistics, supply chain services, testing, etc. So we have companies using those facilities for their own testing and getting uh, results, comparisons to other technologies. So one of the biggest things we did, just to give you some flagship ideas on what we're doing, one is um, the research on audio and multimedia. Um, so there's always a development. We started in 1992 with the first MP3, followed by MP3 surround, MP3 HD. Um, and then different iterations of, of codecs came, advanced audio codec, AAC, etc. And up to now, um, currently, approximately, that's our best guess that we got from the finance people, uh, 7 billion devices are using audio codec technology uh, from Fraunhofer. That's another cool technology they did um, a couple of weeks ago. That's the reason why I'm showing it, that they were challenged with builders at a really extreme, very small camera. A lot of people can do onboard cameras, but this one can stream in real time in HD um, directly to broadcast studios, and this was then sent um, during MotoGP World Championship. Um, that was a classical challenge. Build us something that can do, can do this and that, and Fraunhofer did it, and it worked properly. As I said, it looks like a normal GoPro, but the fun is that it can, over a totally new wireless protocol, even with hundreds of cameras on different motorcycles, stream in real time without any interference with objects, etc., etc. So people at Fraunhofer love to be challenged. That's, that's what I'm saying. So challenge us, tell us what you need and we might find a solution. The first advice is free and we tell you yes, no, maybe, would take that long, would cost this and that, dot resources we would need, etc. Um, but it's, give it a try. Um, maybe we find a solution for you. Um, I just wanna focus on three different technologies that span across the range that we can do. And uh, I have some more technologies that we can discuss later on. Oh, this is how the mic really works. Um, and um, maybe those are not optimal for the audience here because I heard during the day um, that uh, could have been better prepared in terms of life sciences, healthcare, and other stuff. There's some other things I will mention with one or two sentences. One is around Internet of Things. We heard about that a lot in the last couple of months and years. Um, we codenamed it Myoti. Frano is not really creative around code names, but um, Myoti is the Internet of Things technology I'm going to talk about. We have a fraud protection with the super cool name PRS Auth, um, but it's just the name how we call it internally. And we have a sports media technology which is um, further developed um, already, which has a real name and a real company will be founded in the next weeks. And with this example of Jogmo, I will show you the process of from prototype that we had last year, when I've been here, um, to now we're becoming a real um, product, a, a real company and the market reactions on that, which is phenomenal. So, first of all, Myoti, just an example of, of what they're doing. They heard the requirements of the industry around Internet of Things is there's a demand for an alternative solution to the cellular machine-to-machine -machine communication that's not secure enough, that's not stable enough, <clears throat> there's interferences everywhere, um, the battery life doesn't work for people, it has to be maintenance-free, etc. So the dis dis job description was clear and they come up with a solution um, which is now a really, really small sensor with a really interesting chip and some patented algorithm. It's always a combination of hardware and software. Here's the same thing. And what this thing does is um, this small and low complex device, it can be built for a euro or a dollar is best guess, 
um, can send with a battery life up to 15 years, which is pretty amazing, um, over a range for even dozens of kilometers um, with a patented protocol, some discrete data like temperature on, off at a switch, uh, it smells a gas, whatever it is. Everything that a sensor can sense, um, this thing can sense and then send to the external world. Um, there can be up to, I heard, hundred thousands of objects um, with just one antenna in the middle. The antenna can be in a city and the objects that sense stuff can be somewhere in the city. It will still work. We have a test installation here in Nuremberg. Um, and I think there is a market for that because um, that's the, my job now to find out what is the best way to monetize this. Um, if you want to have some technical details, there's a lot around that. I don't want to bore anything and I'm not a technical expert. So I'm, I'm not a f physician, engineer, technology guy. I'm just a pure businessman. Um, but what they did is um, just one example. They found out that in order to send this, um, uh, as they call telegram, um, in, a, in, a, in a secure way, um, it has to be splitted that if there's an interference with other signals or other, um, um, other, yeah, other signals in, in, in the space, um, then it's better to um, split it up into different packages and then resample it again and always sends simple packages um, that are then reconfigured to the original signal. Um, and this works on simple commercial radio frequency chips. As always, the best things in innovations, and I talked about this before, um, is around combining things that are on the market that are cheap, available, um, make a patent around it, wrap it up in a different way, and then sell it again. Um, and this system can now be customized for different applications. As said, we have a permanent test and demonstration in Nuremberg, which means that who, whoever is um, whoever knows the map of, of Bavaria, Nuremberg and Erlangen are let me think, 25 kilometers from each other. I think it's 15 miles or something away. Um, and the antenna is in Erlangen, and we have sensors in Nuremberg, and they send stuff, and the antenna receives it all well. And we check this across the whole metropolitan region. It works well. So we have a real test installation. It's not just uh, something they made up. This thing works. And um, we don't know if the battery life is real. That's calculated because we don't have it installed for 15 years. Um, but usually they're right with what the assumptions are. So I now say there's a business opportunity here. We have some early but real, as I say, interest from, from really big corporations. I um, cannot tell you the names here. It's all on the NDA. But there's interest here from one of the biggest chip manufacturers, from um, people who produce um, Wi-Fi infrastructure. Everybody who's in this area says, that's a cool thing. We need to have a look at it. No deal is signed. And we need now money for the next phase of development. A million or two would help. It's humble. Um, I don't tell you how, what percentage you would get for that in terms of new share equity, but it's a discussion we need to have. And then the institute would be happy to throw in more resources in development before we then go to market with the right partners. Even a standardization could be possible. And I guess from everything I read and the discussions I had with big corporations, the market potential must be way more than billions of sensors because whoever goes to market first owns that market. You can set a de facto standard um, if you just are the first who gets out the door really soon in the next couple of months, which is my wish and the reason why I'm here. Um, so there's just some examples. One um, area is around connected citizen, so a whole sensor ecosystem here. Um, for assisted living, track my family, all of those stuff, because you can combine the positioning systems with those chip, like GNSS, Wi-Fi, etc. Um, I'll just rush through this a little bit quicker. I uh, can send you the deck afterwards. One is around connected mobility. Of course, there's a lot of um, money involved in trains, tramways, truck trailers, ships, airports, everything where you need information on status, door open, closed, stuff like that. You can have one sensor. Right now, I would guess it costs a dollar, stick it somewhere, forget about it for the next 10 years, and it will reliable send a signal what's happening there um, to an antenna network somewhere in the background, which is exactly what this whole IoT community is waiting for and, um, and something we can really make money with. So connected mobility is the other area we can focus on. Smart cities, it's the same thing. Um, from parking slots to waste container control management. If, is the waste container full or not? Um, it's way too expensive to really monitor this manually. You just stick it in, and if it gets dark, then it's full. It sends a signal, please pick me up, etc. So you can have thousands of things that you can think about how to use this. That's all part of the business plan we need to create. Um, so we're now in the 
transition between that's a great idea, we need to monetize it, and looking for the right partners, right people, writing the business plan, etc. So it's a working prototype with potential, I would say. The same with security, safety. Um, we can use this for metering uh, whatever we want, chemical sensors, temperature sensors, industry 4.0 is a big buzzword in Germany right now. Everybody wants to be, or maybe here as well, um, on the next level of automation. And this technology could help you um, in getting it through the door. So that's one basic technology on the percent. Whoever's interested in Internet of Things, let's have a discussion. I have some more spare business cards that I'm happy to share and get in touch with everybody who wants to be involved. And one thing about another reason why I'm here, um, Fraunhofer usually is very good in marketing stuff in Germany. Uh, I told you about the historical reasons. But the other thing is that um, they're not experienced and the legal setup is not really right to just form a legal entity in the US, etc. Um, they love to have a German legal entity because they know the German law. And it's, it's not a joke or a sarcastic, it's just the way they operate. Um, and um, if this German entity then says we have a partner in the US who does the distribution or the licensing, etc., for the American market, that might be an ideal scenario. So it's not only about buying this company or having equity in this company. It might be a licensing deal. It might be a partnership with revenue share models. Um, so that's pretty flexible. Um, but what they're not good at is um, founding something directly in the US. It's always good to have a certain central hub in Germany first and from Germany go to somewhere else. Oh, good. Um, early. We get to be earlier, maybe. Okay. Um, another technology with a very strange code name, but that's just technologist speech is PRF of. So I raised the questions: What do these images have in common? Who has the answer? They're all about fraud protection. Why? Um, this one Louis Vuitton spends 40% almost of their. Um, profits that are doing just on fraud protection because counterfeit is so big. They have 60 people um, sitting in the headquarter alone to try to find out who is copying their bags and their stuff and their suitcases and things like that. It's a huge, huge, huge problem. They want to have a signature somewhere that makes sure um, that this thing is real. The other thing is get the images and release this photograph 2009 um, to prove that there was an attack. In um, 2014, the exact same picture came up as a proof that there was another attack five years later, and somebody found, oh, that's the same picture, cannot be true. Um, but nobody could prove when it was taken, where it was taken, etc. Down there, you just see a car accident, and cars in modern times more and more get cameras um, that should reliably tell you when the picture has been taken and who has been in front of you, etc., especially in Asia. Um, that's a big thing. Every car has a front camera um, that for an accident you have some proofs. So what Fraunhofer did is uh, combining those needs and invent something which they call secure authentication. And they have a patent um, for legally binding fraud resistant time and location information with PRS. What does that mean? Very technology talk. PRS is a public regulated service to something really reliable um, with the German government, but it can be rolled out globally, we hope. Um, together with Galileo, the satellite things here. So the position is absolutely clear, um, almost centimeter precise to can tell where something happened. And together with the other protocols involved, um, they built a reference receiver that says this happened at that point in time, at that place, and this can be a production because there's maybe a chip in a bag that says I was produced at that factory at that time. Um, it can be a timestamp or a watermark on photographs, um, which is digitally marked. That even that is possible, but reliable and said this picture has been taken in, I don't want to know a bad name, but at the World Cup final in Rio, that's positive. Right? Um, at, that, at that certain time and was shot by that person. So you can have watermarks and proofs of um, what place, what time, and who was the originator of certain content, and, and kind of watermark this to a product, to a digital camera, photographs, etc. So there are certain business opportunities. Plaque detection, of course, signatures of images, videos, even for micropayment banking. There could be a view on that. Um, privacy protection, critical infrastructure protection. So, of course, for automated driving as well. There's some, some angles here. Um, that's a prototype that is working for some cases, and whoever has any knowledge in that market, this is the thing I'm looking here, 
um, and who to, how to access this market. Um, we have no experts in the team right now. Um, what to do with that? So that's another typical front of a story. So I selected my examples for some reason to say one thing could be big, uh, but we'll need to go to the next stage. This one, I don't know yet, but who is an expert in this whole fraud protection um, or counterfeit market who can tell us what the market needs, what other technologies exist, um, could be interesting and helpful. Just a second example. And the third one um, is what I love because I've been with that project here last year and want to um, describe what happened in the last 12 months. Um, Jobmo is a project um, we came up with um, because of a technology that Fraunhofer created a couple of years ago, um, which is, uh, which, oh, let's have a look at this first. Sorry.